Uh, I'm happy here today um, to start off our expert workshop series um, with, um, with a special topic today uh, and one of our new members uh, who joined this year, Bayern 04 Leverkusen. And um, the topic will be uh, reopening after COVID-19 um, or actually also during the crisis, which is still going on. And uh, from a perspective of um, uh, the first Bundesliga club, uh, how the Bundesliga did it really, uh, and how you can hopefully take some lessons learned from that as well. Um, a couple of house rules. Um, everyone is going to be um, muted during the course um, of the webinar, um, but we will be able to discuss and answer questions at the end of it. And you can either do that by raising your hand on your right hand side control panel or by asking questions um, in the chat. Um, I will hope you enjoy the presentation and I will give you just a short brief introduction of who we are uh, as GACC Midwest or the German American Chamber of Commerce of the Midwest. Um, I want to allow to introduce myself real quick, uh, Neil Schede, uh, Director for Marketing and Communications, um, here for four years now with the Chamber. and um yeah i've i've been originally from uh, uh kiel germany um up in the north by hamburg um moved over to the us four years ago and i've been with the chamber since um been able to see the marketing world from uh, both sides of the atlantic ocean and uh, it's been an exciting time working with all the different companies and industries uh, that we have here um and Want to also mention we this this series here is open um, for for our members. So usually we have our members present on a topic in cooperation with us um, on uh, relevant issues uh, that hopefully will will help uh, with lessons learned and takeaways as well. And uh, it's my pleasure to also introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. Karl Heinrich Dittmer, the medical director. Uh, for Bayern 04 Leverkusen. Um, very successful team, by the way, this year. I don't know how much you follow um, soccer in Germany, but um, there's a good reason why we are having this webinar today. Uh, the first Bundesliga in Germany was really the first uh, professional league um, worldwide that started playing again. And um, uh, you can follow some of the games here as well uh, on TV. Um, but I think most noteworthy is that Bayern für Leverkusen is going to play um, uh, for the for the German Cup, the DFB Pokal, as it's called, um, coming up against the other Bayern, as I call them. Um, and that's um, that's going to be, I think, in a week from now. But I'll leave I'll leave the soccer specifics uh, to uh, Dr. Dietmar later. Um, quick mention on our network. We are actually part um, of a global uh, network of uh, chambers abroad. Uh, we have 140 offices in 92 countries. Um, and uh, you can see here on the world map uh, how, how we're set up. Um, here in the US alone, um, it's uh, four main offices um, and a couple of satellite offices as well. You can see those here. I think it's important to note that uh, there's about two and a half thousand members, and if I say members, member companies um, that we work with here um, in the US. Uh, as GACC Midwest, we cover um, the whole Midwest and Colorado. Um, and you see with the little flags here on the map, uh, those include our two main offices in Chicago and Detroit, Michigan. Last but not least, um, about us here in the Midwest, uh, about 850 member companies um, serving three chapters, um, considering the size of the US and also here of the Midwest. Uh, we're happy that we have uh, local colleagues in Colorado, Minnesota, and Wisconsin as well. And um, we support German companies in entering the market and uh, with their business development, um, but also with recruiting uh, of professional personnel and intercultural training. Um, and especially over the last couple of years, um, have increased our efforts in creating um, German-style apprenticeships, apprenticeship programs here uh, in the US um, that are actually uh, certified after um, the German model and uh, many other things as well. 
Uh, we're the official representative of German industry and trade in our region. Uh, we do serve as a service provider to companies that I just mentioned. And of course, we are a member organization, which is part of why we are all here together today. Uh, and why we're thankful that Bayern of Leverkusen uh, has decided to become part of our network. And we hope that we can uh, support uh, the club along its way to enter the market, uh, which we started last year by broadcasting a game. And um, I'm happy that this is now the second uh, if digital um, cooperative effort uh, that we can make. Uh, with no further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Dittmar and look forward um, to your presentation. Thank you. So microphones turned on, huh? first thing works. Yep. Webcam too, perfect. That's very good. Yeah, so yesterday we didn't make it up to this point, so I'm quite quite happy um, that we that I can be here with you. Um, I really feel honored to share my my uh, little uh, information I got about uh, and uh, all the things which happened in the last months with COVID-19 in the professional soccer team to share with you, and perhaps you can take something for as a take home message or whatever. So uh, I just, next slide please. Go on. Yeah, it's all started in March. When I remember January this year, New Year's Eve, um, everybody was perfect. We, we heard something about some strange virus in China, but nobody ever thought that, that such a situation which occurred would ever be uh, possible. So it was a situation nobody expected. I'm a medical doctor and as a medical doctor you always follow new new things in, in medicine and, and so on and so on. But this was nothing I took as a, as a topic um, for this year. So in January everything was normal even in February. But in March it started it started immediately and it hit us all, all over the world really hard, I think. And actually it was a situation nobody, almost nobody, was really prepared for and nobody planned. Next slide please. Something about the German Soccer League. Uh, we have 18 clubs in the first division, which is called the Bundesliga. We have 18 clubs in the second division, which is called the second Bundesliga. We have, it's just not a business with some soccer players, it's a business with, with over 56,000 uh, 56, employees in the German professional soccer. So it's a big company. We have an annual turnover uh, for more than 4.2 billion uh, euros just in the first division. We get our money by media rights, which is the most important thing, by visitors in the stadiums. Our biggest stadiums uh, do have uh, up to 80,000 spectators and merchandising uh, as well. Um, under the German Professional Soccer League, we have a third division, which is in Professional uh, Division 2. We have amateur, amateur divisions. We have a Professional Women's League. Uh, we have the German Cup, we have the UEFA and the FIFA uh, as international, European and worldwide organization. Next slide, please. Just my personal situation. I'm the director of the medical department, which means uh, it's a big responsibility. It's not just for the medical doctors or the physiotherapists. We also have a re rehabilitation department. We, uh, in this department, we have the sports science, we have the athletics, we have performance, we have sports psychologists. So it's a big department. We, uh, we are full-time members, about 35 people at this moment. So it's quite a huge squad uh, what I have to work with. And second, I am a medical doctor. I work as team doctor for our first league team. Um, but I'm not, as usual, a... Uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon. I'm a doctor for internal medicine, which is something special. But in the situation of a virus infection, it might be quite good uh, to to work uh, every day with virus infections and not uh, with knees and hips and whatever. So uh, 
yeah, it was something special. I have a private practice uh, with about uh, 8,000 patients a year together with two colleagues. Uh, so it's quite work beside of my job in this team. And last but not least, I am since years the pandemic representative and responsible for this mid-sized company, Bionulfia. We are about 300 people who work uh, for Bionulfia. It was just a job on the paper they gave me about three or four years ago. I don't really remember. And we had one meeting. We had to have such a thing like a pandemic representative because we are part of the big Bayer company. And as a big company, you have to have something. No other soccer team had a pandemic representative before COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so I was the only one. And uh, when I agreed to be it, to, to be the representative, uh, I never could imagine what, uh, what amount of work it would have been for me in the future. So, um, yeah, but I was catched and uh, you can't leave this ship uh, when you are in the water. So, um, yeah, now I am the pandemic responsible and uh, what it means for me. Please, the next slide. Um, the day our CEO told me that I'm the most important person in the club, uh, first I felt honored, but uh, later on I found out what it meant to me. There were questions over questions from my part. There were limited answers because what all all experts said this virus is new nobody knows too much about it and uh, same same with me uh, i just knew what all uh, other experts uh, um, told me and uh, so my answers to many many questions were very very limited um, my knowledge uh, has improved since then but um, yeah okay in the beginning it was quite tough. and the need for my personal opinion was everywhere and anytime. So I never had so many meetings. I never had so many people who asked me things. And uh, um, yeah, I really was the most important person in the club, and I'm still, still, uh, I still am. But uh, it's not just an honor; it's a lot of work. Next slide, please. Okay, lockdown in the professional team. First steps. What had we had to do? First, we had to explain everyone that the problem is serious. Everybody uh, thought in the beginning it's just a little flu, it's just uh, a little cold. Uh, we had uh, we had uh, years ago uh, something was called pig flu uh, or birds flu. It was nothing. It was hyped as a, a major problem, but nobody was was harmed uh, really. So. Uh, Everybody thought it was a thing like uh, like this, uh, where um, nothing probably will happen. Um, second, everybody thought the problem will will disappear pretty soon. Might be a problem for two weeks, three weeks, and especially when it gets warm, like this this uh, this uh, flu, uh, it disappears. But there was no evidence that it would happen, and it didn't happen because we had COVID in the warmer countries, where on the south side of the world, uh, south, southern part of the world, and uh, it was warm. One of the of the major uh, hotspots in the beginning were the Arabic uh, Emirates, and uh, it was always hot over there. So the temperature might help, but it was not the solution of the problem. Um, yeah, that there is no solution for the problem yet. Um, there is no uh, uh, no medication, no vaccination, nothing to do. We just have to wait and see what happens. And then I was the one who had to suspend training. I had to tell the coach that after to uh, regarding to all the regulations from the authorities. We were not able to train anymore. So training was suspended from one day to another. And next step, I had to send everyone home. Um, so I had to send the coach home, the staff home, and the players. 
and nobody knew when, which time we could restart. Next slide, please. Yeah, we had to organize home office, which is not easy, uh, but to organize home office for a professional soccer team is more difficult because uh, if you do a video conference and you talk, you don't get, uh, you don't stay fit, you don't keep your performance. So we had to organize um, things, training plans um, for our players at home. We were, we thought about a lockdown um, might be 10 days before it arrived. So we were prepared, we had we prepared training plans and I was one who bought about 45 treadmills uh, to send to the players at home. Lockdown was uh, on uh, Friday and all players had their treadmills um, at least the uh, latest on Monday. So uh, it was a big logistic thing to organize all this. We made a video connection that we could train with them at home and we could control the home training. Controlling of home training, we did by questionnaires, we did by um, by heart rate recording, by um, multiple devices. It's not that difficult. We are used to this from holidays uh, of the players and, uh, and so on. Next, we had to keep the players, the coaches and their families informed. What I found out that the biggest problem for all the players was the, the fear that something could happen to their families. They were not scared of themselves or for themselves, or, but for their families. So uh, could the family from our South American players stay safe in South America? Should they, be South America? Should they better come to to Europe, could those who are in Europe stay? You had problems with visa uh, that they could just as a tourist uh, allowance uh, stay 30 days. So we had to to do a lot of things, and finally we had to start preparing the day after. Next, please. Yeah, lockdown in the company company was similar explain to everyone that the problem is serious same like in the players but the understanding of the people in the company was was better uh, a soccer player um, many many things for professional soccer players are different in life than for regular ordinary people and uh, so it was easier to deal with this topic with all the other employees uh, the players were the toughest yeah, again, explain that the problem will last long, explain that uh, there is no solution for the problem yet, suspend work, so we uh, send them all uh, in home office from one day to another. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, home office for all employees, and it worked well. I'm very, very surprised that it worked that well when I think about video conferences or webinars or whatever uh, we had a lot since the lockdown i can count uh, the, the the video meetings i had before on one hand so uh, now i need a lot of hands and um, yeah it worked very very well so we had to secure essential needs for the company which is IT, like uh, organizing this home office work for everybody, uh, it, well, we were very, very good prepared. This was one thing we had in our pandemic plan before, uh, so um, this was quite, was quite easy. To secure salary for the employees, uh, if nobody is, uh, is in the office, so we had to make it possible that all uh, all money we have to, to give to our employees uh, through bank transfer, whatever would be possible, even from home, and it worked. Human resources was a department which needed a lot of help because uh, they uh, had to organize and they were responsible for the safety of uh, our employees. So there was a lot of things to do. Information for all employees and was it was the con continuing. Thing. Uh, so we had uh, uh, via email, via um, video conferences, 
we shared all the information we got um, very, very uh, uh, often with all the people so that we got a, big, a good understanding what we do and why. Information of the board, the influence, the impact on our income, no more TV money and, and, and so on and so on was very, very important. So our board also wanted to have uh, um, information uh, how, what they had to expect in the future. And once again, preparing the day after. Uh, right now we are in, in the company at the day after and our preparations went very well too. Next slide, please. Okay, now we come back to the to our to my main topic topic, restart the German Bundesliga. What we did, we established with the German Federation and the um, DFL uh, a task force, which were some medical doctors, uh, some uh, officials, and we made. Not we, they made a plan. I was not part of this task force. They uh, planned and established a protocol, which uh, I will uh, explain a little bit later. Uh, furthermore, we had to convince government and the authorities that with this plan, with this uh, concept, it's safe to play, safe to be in contact with other people. Uh, starting with tennis or something which gives some problems at this moment but starting with tennis is not that, that big, uh, such a big problem because you can keep a distance in a sport like soccer there is no big distance uh, in the match in the training so uh, we had to convince uh, all those authorities that it is safe and it's, it's uh, going along with all this uh, pandemic uh, uh, needs Okay, next we had to transmit the protocol to all clubs, which means clubs of first Bundesliga, second Bundesliga, women's league, uh, third league and amateurs that, that went all together. Things which are easy for us as a big club to handle like uh, uh, special hotels, special tools in the stadium or whatever uh, is much easier uh, than for a, a club which, which uh, which this budget is much, 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 much lower. And um, so uh, it was quite a lot of work to convince them uh, in all the teams how and why we had to do this. Next, please. Then we had to make clear that we have to follow the protocol for a long, long time. Um, we follow it, we started at the end of April and we will go on until the cup final which take part, will take part on July 4th, uh, so next week Saturday and um, afterwards we will can lower all, all, all things a little bit but some, some uh, parts of the concept still will go on. Very very difficult was to catch the coaches, to convince the coaches of the protocol because so many things were totally different and all the things they ever have seen in their whole life and uh, especially for a soccer player. So many things are so much different for a soccer player and so many things which are normal for everybody are not normal for a professional soccer players. So it was very, very difficult to catch them and to, to bring them on our way. Catching the officials was easier. Catching the players was not that difficult to a, a thing. We had big problems with was catching the public because everybody said, oh, they want to go back to the stadium and play soccer when all the schools are still closed, when all the, uh, the, the ch children uh, caretakers are not available, all stores are closed. And or restaurants are closed, cinemas are closed, and with soccer they start. So those are the people who earn a lot of money and it's sure that they are uh, the first. And so the public opinion, opinion was quite difficult uh, in this time, but there was a lot of work to do. So, um, and people got interesting uh, 
who were never interesting before. So I was invited several times to uh, to the to TV shows, and uh, n nobody invited me in any time uh, in my life before, and probably not after. But in this time, uh, I could have gone to every day to a, to a big show, and I went to some major events to to work to um, advertise for uh, this concept. Catching the fans, yeah, it was quite serious and quite needed too, because we didn't want, when we started games, to have 5,000 friends in front of the stadium. The first game without spectators before lockdown uh, was a game next to us uh, from the team from Cologne against Mönchengladbach. Uh, and there were many, many fans, some thousand fans in front of the stadium. And this was, you, you can do in, in pandemic times. So distance and everything you can keep uh, with spectators totally uncontrolled in front of the stadium. So uh, we had to, to discuss with all our fans that uh, this is not the time uh, to be close to the matches. Okay, next one, please. Okay. The concept of the task force contains several things. Some I will uh, explain a little bit deeper. The medical concept for training and matches, organizational specifications in the stadium, hygienic guidelines and procedures in the stadium, guidelines for media and TV production, requirements for assumption of team training in small groups, requirements for team accommodation, uh, requirements for resumption of team training, requirements for in quarantine. Next one. Major essential in the concept is that infections must be kept away from the players, coaches and staff. So if there would have been infections in, in, a, uh, in the team, we would have had big, big problems because um, if you send if you get sent in quarantine uh, for one for just the person who's infected or for contact persons is a decision of the local health authority and uh, in cities like Munich where every player lives in Munich it might be easy in a city like Leverkusen um, we have the problem that no player lives in Leverkusen they live in Cologne and Düsseldorf and Dortmund all over but not in Leverkusen. And so I had uh, to deal with 11 health, de health departments and every health department itself could have sent the whole team for 14 days in quarantine. Uh, quarantine. And um, this would have been a big, big problem, but we didn't have any positive testing yet. So I'm very happy, but risk min minimization, uh, infections out of the team was essential to to survive with this concept agreements with authorities prior to a problem yeah, it's good to talk with them uh, what the way to behave is uh, if something happens uh, before you before we uh, have um, the problem and uh, but as i said before with 11 health departments it's quite it's quite difficult because they all have other things to do and they are not very happy with soccer uh, or uh, not all very happy with soccer okay public creations for the concept uh, i just told others and i went to tv shows we had uh, interviews uh, in the newspapers and so on and so on so that we could convince the public and uh, politicians and authorities that they would, have, would give us this chance to uh, use this concept. Next one, please. Pa main part of the concept is the PCR testing before resumption of training. Then we went on to training in small groups that if anybody, well, if someone would have been infected, we just, just would have to send a small group in quarantine. And um, then we went on with regular PCR testing twice to three times a week. Uh, in 
at the beginning of training, we did an antibody testing, um, and we did a second antibody testing uh, again. It's just to prove to prove that uh, the the PCR testing is is valid and that we don't have in fact or that we, we don't have uh, positive testings in the PCR, and uh, as a result, we don't have no antibodies. In, at the beginning and afterwards, so uh, it's uh, it should uh, prove the quality of the PCR testing. And then finally, we returned to team training. Next slide, please. Um, we had to do to create requirements, safety requirements for the match. We had to. Uh, deal with hygienic aspects uh, in the match. Just COVID-19 negative tested people could get in contact. Um, there were just this limited group of people on the pitch which uh, don't have to have distance. All the others had to have distance and had to wear masks. We established a regularly PCR testing for all the others which got anyhow, anytime uh, in contact with the teams. Plus using distance plus using masks. We had to establish a strict access control to the stadium. And as I mentioned before, we had to control somehow the fans in those ghost games, in those games without spectators. Uh, in the first test before the lockdown, as I mentioned before, about three to 5,000 people in front of the stadium. And uh, this was not good too. With all these problems, if they would have occurred again, politics would have stopped our concept and would have stopped our games. Next, please. Quarantine is very, very important in this concept. We have a team quarantine in training, just together, players, coaches, and staff, which are regularly tested. And they don't have to come, uh, they're not able to get in contact with all other people. Before a game or after a game, press conferences were, uh, were uh, video meetings. And no, no, uh, we didn't, when we started without an infection and we would follow this concept, it was actually not possible to get infected. Then we had a domestic everyday quarantine which was very, very tough for all because this means the players just had to be in the stadium at the training ground and at home. They were not allowed to have visitors at home. They were not allowed to go out for a restaurant. They were not allowed to go out for a hairdresser or shopping. And this is for the whole family, including kids, including, uh, including the wife and so it was very, very, very difficult to explain to the um, to the players. Domestic quarantine in case of infection is no problem. They are alone for 14 days, um, and we had to plan return to team training after an infection. Um, for God's sake, it didn't happen at, in Liverpool. Okay, next, please. Here I show you how they did it in a stadium they it's in german excuse me um we made different zones first zone is the inner zone where you have the pitch where you have the the um, locker rooms where you have the area around the pitch which only people controlled uh, tested pcr tested regularly twice a week and um, we had the zone two which uh, where you have media, where you have uh, police, where you have technical control, and and so on and so on. And we had the stadium, the out place outside the stadium zone three, where you have the broadcast when, uh, where you have uh, security personnel that no fans uh, come to the stadium. Those were the, was the concept of three zones. Go on. And we had a dynamic. Um, planning of people which were at which time in uh, each zone. The maximum of people in three zones was about 300 people. 
So in stadium for 80,000 people, maximum 300 people is not much, um, but it's in, it's in the in the uh, in the uh, in the top uh, moment. Uh, in the beginning, it's very very much less. Next, yeah, here um, for example, zone one is, is the referees, is the players, is the substitutes. It's a functional team, so one who give back uh, the balls. It's a hygienic personal. It's just three photographers. It's um, uh, some security people and uh, very few which uh, are recording and sitting in the camera and uh, and so on. The rest is not very interesting. Just delegation of uh, home and away team delegation with this big board of clubs, limited to four people from the away team and eight people from the home team. This was quite tough if you have a board of 10 people to find out which one could be there. And uh, so, but it was not my discussion. They had it uh, on the board and um, yeah, it was quite tough to find all the ones which uh, uh, to eliminate those you couldn't have. So altogether, you see about 300. Okay, next please. Just graphics um, with, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit late already. It's just graphics where uh, someone is. Go, go on, it's not that important. Next one's another graphic. Yeah, you see the pitch and even the substitutes were uh, on, the, on the Tribune. So, uh, we kept distance uh, one and a half to two meters from each other. So uh, uh, a substitute bench was normally 18 people. We had five on. So um, yeah, it looked quite funny. Um, next one. Okay, we even even had uh, had to do uh, requirements for TV production. This is a broadcast when you see. On the left uh, slide, or the part of the slide, it's, it's of those great things are people. Um, it's crowded with people, and it's very, very few people on the right side in times of Corona. Next, please. And here you, it's a broadcast when how it looked. Yes, we have separated uh, with uh, those uh, glass or plastic things, and we had to create all over possibilities to disinfect and wash hands. So this was uh, a mobile device for hand disinfection and hand washing. Next, please. Results. Bundesliga resumed on May 16th as first major professional league in the world. Bundesliga will finish on June 27th. In between, we didn't miss any game we had no team which uh, had problems uh, with COVID infections, except one team in the second leap, which started 14 days later because they had some infections in the beginning, which were proven the tests were false. So uh, now uh, it's a, a risical problem how they will deal with this. Our German Cup will finish on July 4th and for Bayer Leverkusen, it's the first time we reached the cup final since 11 years. It's just to beat Bayern Munich, which will not be that difficult uh, in, uh, in, uh, on July 1st. I'm quite convinced that we can do it. And right now we are working on Restart 2.0 and this time they invited me to join this task force and to give my, uh, my experience for the task force. Yeah, okay, go on. Yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm open for question. questions. The next slide you find uh, my email address. Next one, please. Uh, which is car.ditma at bionofia.te. So you're always invited if you have questions, if you need help in, uh, with your company, with your league or whatever, to contact me via email. And I, when I can, I really would appreciate to help you. So thank you for your attention. Well, first of all, uh, also from me, 
Dr. Dittmar, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon in your time or here in the early morning. Um, I think we have attendees from both sides of the Atlantic this morning here. Um, thank you for your insights, very unique insights, uh, and thanks for sharing those. Um, we can now enable uh, and unmute you if you raise your hand, if you have questions, um, and you can also submit them via chat. And um, I think we got some here already. Um, and I'm going to read it to you, uh, Dr. Dittmar. Um, yep. I have the question of how your club and the DFL plans for the next season, which starts in two months already. Yeah. Um, do you have plan to use the status quo protocol or do you have new plans? No, you can't go on with the status quo protocol for a whole season. This uh, this domestic quarantine is so strong, so tough. You can't tell a whole family um, to stay at home. Um, I was uh, affected by this quarantine too with my family, and uh, I had my children, which are my youngest daughter is 16, um, my oldest son is 29. They all had to stay at home. They couldn't meet friends. I had. Uh, my my young girl, which is 16, just came back from a high school year from uh, from Texas, and she wanted to meet their friends, her friends, and it was not possible. So uh, just uh, if you if you uh, were used to meet your friends via uh, Skype or whatever, FaceTime um, for for months, and you are back in Germany, back in your home country. You really want to to be together with them, and we couldn't. So things like this, uh, I, I didn't was not able to go to to shop. Uh, uh, okay, it's not that problem, big problem for me. Um, but uh, you know, uh, you can't. It's it's every everybody, uh, everything around was lowered. People, restaurants opened. Um, Contacts from people were allowed all, all all over, and we were in quarantine. This was is not possible for a whole season. So we will lower the restrictions in the new season, but um, we are uh, uh, we are working on a new plan right now. But it will be much less uh, as long as Corona stays in Germany, in Europe, as it is. So situation in Germany is at this moment much easier than the US. In the US, we, you uh, unfortunately hear of many, many uh, new infections every day. I think it's the highest level of, of all time in the last days. So um, our problem is, is for God's sake, very, very low at this moment, and we can lower our restrictions. But you never know what will happen. We are it's an it's an protocol. It's a concept which lives, and it can be uh, in some days totally different according to a new uh, pandemic wave, uh, COVID wave. You never. Know. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. I have one more question here. Um, what technological aids, hardware, software does the team use, but also maybe the buyer AG, uh, to ensure the safety and healthiness of the employees and workers? Yeah, first of all, we establish an app um, where we ask with a questionnaire all employees, all players, all coaches, all staff members every day. Uh, first, how they feel, if they have difficulties in tasting, if they cough, if they feel sick, and so on and so on. It's about, I think, eight questions we ask every morning. We wow. establish at the at our entrance uh, temperature control so it's uh, everybody who enters the stadium or our our offices must control the temperature just if you have fulfilled those things um, you are allowed to enter stadium or the office and um, um, yeah, we give a lot of information to them. We have a hotline. A hotline. If someone gets a problem, he reaches immediately a medical doctor to get advice. Uh, we arranged a lot of testing, even not not only with the players but also with uh, with uh, the whole company. 
So before we bring um, bring back our uh, people to the offices, they are tested, and we offer regular testing to them. It's it's free of will. It's it's you can't uh, you can make it. Uh, um, yeah, that it's needed, but uh, everybody takes it. So uh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And, yeah, this is all. And other big technical things you don't need. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's. I think that's the question too. The, the app, I think, is something significant. And that's probably what people here heard about too. There is now the, the Corona app in Germany as well. Uh, that's, that's something we don't have. We don't have over here, unfortunately, yet. Yeah, the Corona app they established right now in public is a little bit different. It's anonymous and it tells you if you are in contact with someone who's tested corona positive and gives you the advice to get tested too. So our app is different. Uh, it's just an app where you can uh, where you can find out if you have a problem and they can communicate that you have a problem and get advice. But we started with this app about two months ago. So we are very early. Right, yeah. Uh, we have one more question here. Um, and that is how did cooperating with local or national government work in regards to restarting um, and continuing to play? With the government in Berlin, it was quite easy. We had a lot of understanding and we had a lot of supporters. Local authorities were very different. We had areas with big big problems the worst place for a soccer team was the city of bremen there was uh, the head of the medical uh, department uh, of the of the ta of the city uh, didn't like soccer at all couldn't understand that uh, what we were trying to do and they gave them so many problems so uh, they started at, at, i think two weeks later than the rest um, with training, with team training, because uh, requirements were so high. And other, like in our city, cooperation with our local uh, health department was very, very good. I got a lot of help and advice from, from them because this pandemic and infectious things, it's their everyday work and not mine. So, yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm very grateful that they helped me. and. Uh, yeah, it's well better than we thought. Some politicians tried to to uh, to use the publicity of soccer um, to tell that there is not enough PCR tests available and other people wouldn't get PCR tests because soccer takes it, which was never true. But uh, yeah, those politicians you see uh, all day long on and tv shows but we proved that they were wrong and actually one more question came in here um dr Dittmar, while um you were replying uh, how did the response to COVID differ between the soccer club and the Bayer ag as in the company or was it maybe the same yeah for for a soccer team it's possible to have a total lockdown. We started with a total lockdown. Such a big company like the Bayer company with machines running and so ever, you couldn't, couldn't lock down totally, but it's, uh, they were good prepared. A big company like this, they have all kind of emergency plans, even a pandemic plan. Probably they never hoped that they would uh, take it out of the drawer. But uh, they were prepared very good, and uh, yeah, it was for us helpful to be in contact with uh, the the uh, people who did it in the company to get advice for ourselves in our small company. And uh, yeah, they did it very well too. They didn't had to close the company. Other companies across the river of Rhine. There's a company uh, which uh, makes cars, Ford, everybody knows probably in the US. They had a total 
total lockdown, shut down. They stopped production. BW stopped the production. Bayer company could go on, but they also produced pharmaceuticals and things yeah. which were needed. So these were uh, uh, companies uh, with special special uh, importance. So it was easier for them to go on, but I think they managed it perfect too. Right now in our city in Leverkusen, which is about 180,000 inhabitants, we have three active infections, three. Wow, that's great. Um, yeah, I don't see any further questions at the moment. Um, I'll leave it open for another minute here to uh, raise your hand or send us another chat. And I see we get, we're getting one more in, um, if that's okay. I'm fine. And here we go. Um, what is your personal personal impression about playing in empty stadiums? I don't like it. <laughs> so my I work now since 18 years in professional football, uh, soccer, and um, my most my best game I ever had was. Cup final 11 years ago in Berlin. It's a, it's a party. It's a, it's the thing in German soccer. So I'm it hits me right in my heart that next week I will be in the stadium with uh, 300 to 400 people without any atmosphere. Without uh, uh, this is a different kind of soccer, but it's closer back to the soccer. You have in small cities, small uh, places, in the, in the amateur leagues, in the very low amateur leagues. Um, yeah, this is a little bit closer to the, to the roots, perhaps. But you have to take care. Um, if I'm a medical doctor. I sit on the bench, and I have my opinion too, which is not always the same than the coaches. And uh, usually, I cry something, I shout something on the field, but nobody can hear it, but now everybody hears it. And if as they go right, they look at me, hey, what, what's your problem? And if I tell this, the, the referee that my opinion about his, uh, his decision is different, um, yep, uh, it's difficult too. And this year, um, they started, or this season, they started with yellow and red cards for the Function team, so we never had so many yellow and red cards for the functional team or the staff than in this period of time. Because if you tell the referee that he might need uh, glasses or something, uh, you are you get a card and you pay for it. They they kind you for such things like this. Yeah, so yeah, okay. But you get used to it after a couple of matches. It seemed more normal without spectators, but I, I wait for the day we are back with 80,000 people in the stadium. If you are, for example, in the stadium from Dortmund and you have a, they call the yellow wall, yeah. 20,000 people from 25,000 Dortmund fans who stand in front of this, of this uh, wall and they shout something. It's, it's, it's a feeling uh, which can imagine and I missed it and I hope it will be coming back pretty soon but I, I, I think it will take some time. Yes. Yeah I think uh, for, for everyone who has been watching some of the matches it, it was quite different when it was either so quiet that you could hear every single person on the field and then I think there were some also where they played background noises in later yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to see to see that difference. Um, yeah. I think we have one last question here that came in while we were talking. Uh, were the players less motivated uh, than playing with fans? Is that something you noticed? Actually, when they are on the pitch, they are in a kind of a tunnel. But you say the fans is the 12th player. So uh, it gives you, if you score a goal and might push you a little bit 
it's slightly slightly less motivation because we have to reach our goals we have our goal is to reach the champions league our goal is to win the cup final this is about the same but the the kick from the 12th player which are the fans uh, uh, you don't have and um, yeah it's pity that it's like this but you have no other chance at this moment yeah but motivation yeah. Well, I think that brings us almost to the end of our time. Um, first of all, thank you again, and also for those very personal insights and opinions uh, that you shared with us here on the on the answers. Um, first thing I want to say, uh, good luck against the other Bayern uh, coming up on the Independence Day. Uh, so That's it's actually on, on, the, on the national holiday here. Uh, a lot of us probably will be uh, having that on anyways, because there's no other professional sports going on right now here either um so yeah that's coming up on july 4th we we, we cross our fingers and hold our thumbs how, how we do it on both sides um and i would like to announce one more thing for for our uh, viewers on august 12th we will have our digital um small and mid-sized enterprise forum also completely online uh you can sign up already on our website and i invite you to check that out um dr Dittmar, thank you so much for taking the time with us here today we're very happy to have Bayern Ulf Leverkusen with us in our network. Uh, and we also look forward to uh, maybe seeing you in person at some point again when we can uh, in, in, in the next year or so. Uh, good yeah. luck. And thank Come you so much. To our beautiful stadium when it's allowed again. Uh, we really would love to see you all uh, personal. And uh, yeah, thank you for me. It was a pleasure. And uh, stay healthy. Thank you. You too. Goodbye. Bye.